Welcome to the Crisis Response and Preparedness Module of Librarian 411. This video will provide you with some basic skills to use when crisis occurs in the library. We will examine how crisis progresses, discuss physical and verbal responses to crisis, and explore validation as a tool to diffuse crisis. This module applies to all library patrons, not just those with disabilities or mental illness. After all, any library patron can become upset or be in crisis. Patrons with mental illness or disabilities are no more or less likely to experience crisis than your average customers. Now, Alan Nellis, Tanya Hayes-Martin, and Amanda Coffin from the Fulton State Hospital Library will get us started. We've all had situations that gotten out of control in our library. Working at Fulton State Hospital, we expect those kind of challenges every day. In several years of providing live trainings to public library staff, I found out that they expect those kind of situations every day too. Now, as mental health workers, Tanya, Amanda, and I receive training every year on how to effectively respond to crisis. But I've talked to many public library workers who have little concept of how to respond to crisis in a calm and poised manner. Now, I obviously can't provide a whole day's worth of training in the next few minutes, but I do hope to provide you with some ideas, tips, and pointers on how to deal with things when bad things happen in your library and you're even threatened with bodily harm and the entire flow of library services is disrupted. It's useful to have a model when we discuss crisis. One model that's popular amongst mental health and other professionals who consistently deal with crisis is known as the stress model of crisis. Now let's take a look at this model. We see through the middle of the model a baseline. Now what's our baseline? That's a normal day. We call that first stage of crisis the triggering event. Now that's anything that your patron perceives as a threat to their well-being. So, there's some obvious triggering events we could have, such as a loud thunderstorm outside, the fire alarm goes off, uh, somebody pushes a library cart down the steps accidentally. Uh, we know about those and we'll all see them and they will all trigger some disruption in our baseline behavior. But most of the people who come into the library and have triggering events have them because of things we can't see. In the case of a mentally ill person, this could be responding to internal stimuli, hearing voices in their head. In the case of other people, it could be events such as a major life change, like their wife just left them, or uh, they just found out that a close relative died. Or something could be happening even in the news that is disrupting their sense of belief and their ideas about how the world should work. Now, these aren't going to be very easy to observe, so oftentimes crises can seem to come out of nowhere. However, it always began with a triggering event. Now Amanda, Tanya, and Alan will discuss the signs of escalation. Well, I think the most common traditional sign is people begin to raise their voice. I would agree. Yes, me too. They also may step into your personal space. Right, and their, their language can be a lot different than it normally is. You know, like they can start to make a lot of accusatory you-type statements. And what about some nonverbal signs? Could someone right. get red in the face, mm -hmm. clench their fist, intently stare at the person that they're upset with? Pointing. Right. You know, one thing we see at Fulton State Hospital a lot is just a real increase in muscle tension across the whole body. But, on the other hand, a lot of people have no visible signs of escalation. And we, we see that a lot too where we work, don't we? And they're the kind yes. of person who does a real slow boil, uh, you know, what is it, still waters run deep, and uh, you know, they even seem calmer as they escalate. Let's look at some ways we can try to maintain a poised appearance. Now, there's two ways we can vary from looking poised, and one is, even though we're not invading someone's personal space, to give some signs that we're really feeling pretty aggressive and angry. Now, what do you think, Tanya? Does this look pretty mean? Yes. What, I got my arms crossed, I'm scowling, you know. But uh, why, don't, why don't you show us what it would, the, the other way we could go away from poise, which would be timid and fearful looking. A uh, timid and fearful response to someone who's getting angry 
might be that I would not make as much eye contact with them. I might try to back away from the situation and may not continue that communication that's necessary when someone's upset. Mm -hmm. now, and I could actually, you know, kind of be right. shaking and scared of the patron now, and show my fear. Right, right. Now, in our training, we're taught to maintain what's called an open stance. Now, why don't you show that to okay. us, Amanda? Because we, we, we work on this, and it's just become second nature to most of us. What, what are the characteristics well, of an open stance? It's important to um, keep eye contact and also stand at approximately 45 degree angle, keep your hands next to your side and open, try to appear relaxed. Right, and this really helped because you seem approachable. Right. Now, we've mentioned personal space before, and personal space can really vary in different cultures. So some people in other cultures are used to being closer together, but in our culture here in the United States, we're very used to having at least an arm's length of personal space, and that's considered a lot, but I want to tell you, we need to have more personal space when we're getting in a situation where somebody is going to get upset and potentially become aggressive. And Tanya's going to demonstrate right now why one arm's length is just not enough. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so, you know, you've got to uh, not look like you're backing off into oblivion, but you've got to uh, try to maintain a good bit of personal space. Now, what's something else I can do to kill? You could also put an object right. between you and the patron. So if, if I'm on this side of the desk and you're on that side of the desk, it's going to take a lot longer for you right. to get to me. Now, but what's the worst thing you could do? The worst thing you can do is back yourself into a corner. Right, and, and, uh, or even worse. Or even worse, turn your back right, on the right. patron don't, who's upset. Don't turn your back to walk away. You won't always be the one responding to the crisis situation. You may observe another staff member dealing with an upset customer. What should you do in this case? Don't assume that the other staff person has the situation under control. Move closer to the situation in order to see and hear what is happening. If you decide to intervene, remember to use a poised physical and verbal response. Provide for your own safety and that of other patrons. Call the authorities if necessary. If the situation continues to decompensate despite your best efforts, don't be afraid to call the authorities. If you are afraid for your own safety and for the safety of others in the library, it is your duty to call for help. Calling for help is not a failure on your part, and it's better to err on the side of caution. Now let's look at our verbal response to escalating behavior. It's our best shot at diffusing a crisis situation. We want to learn to express empathy rather than sympathy. Now there's a process of communication that's helped me do that a lot in recent years. It's called validation. And in my work and challenges that I have every day with crisis situations, nothing has helped me more than learning as much as I could about validation. Now, the first step in being validating is to learn some forms of communication that are just automatically invalidating. And telling someone that what they think and their perceptions of the situation aren't true cannot be validating. For example, one that we've heard, Tanya. If a patron was looking for information and my response would be, I don't have any information on residential hyperbaric chambers. Is there something real I could help you with today in the library? Right. That would be an invalidating okay. statement. Right. Or say there's a patron who's, who's often, you know, considered a trouble causer, and you've just had to tell him a program's been canceled. Uh, the worst thing you could say was, you aren't really upset because the program is canceled. You're just trying to make trouble. Right. So besides telling them that their perceptions are incorrect, another way we can be really invalidating is if we tell them their feelings are just wrong. So uh, what's a way we do that? Well, I could tell somebody that they shouldn't get so worked up over their overdue fines because it's really not that much money. It's not that big of a deal. Right. And it's really not money that's got them upset. Or um, what if we express some kind of pejorative term in referring to them? Say normal people don't get upset because they have overdue books. Right. That's probably not going to be helpful. And at last, there's a way that we can really turn things back on our own feelings that's always invalidating. If we start to think about our own feelings, that's, that's not just validation is not possible at that time. So, like, if I told you that I was getting upset because I couldn't get a magazine I wanted. 
And I said, I know, right? I'm just so upset we're not getting that magazine anymore. Wow, yeah, or maybe I'm complaining because the library's too loud. And I could feed into that and say, I know it is loud in here. I just wish we could go back to the good old days when everybody sat quietly and read books. Let's look at some ways that we can try to positively express validation in our communication. Now, the biggest thing we can do in the libraries, we've already mentioned, is trying to learn exactly what the customer wants. And uh, to do that, we've got to take into account what their perception is and realize that even if that perception isn't realistic or the feelings that the situation is creating in them seem unreasonable, that they're valid for them. And so uh, let's see, uh, for example, Amanda, what if I come up to you and uh, I'm talking about government conspiracies and how the government's out to get me and at the end of it, I even start to sound like the library's out to get me. So you think the government is out to get you and that the library is part of it? Right, so you're letting me know that it seems reasonable to you. Um, what, Tanya, what if, what if you come into the library and you're in the library restroom and somebody's doing you know, some laundry in there and, and you're having to tell them that it, it's against policy? Well, this may upset them and I might say, you seem really surprised that the library right. doesn't allow laundry doing right. in the restroom sink. Right and let them know that I understand how they're feeling. Right, it's validate, you're validating their idea that it was reasonable to do their laundry in the sink. Now, uh, sometimes people come up with things that just seem really strange to your concept of right and wrong or good or bad. For example, if I came in making some really irrational statements about my relationship with God, you know. You must be really out of it if you think God is your lover. Right, that, that's not helpful because they really think that. Or, uh, for example, what if uh, I'm a person with a real low reading ability and you know this and I'm asking for books about advanced calculus? Well, I might say, I really think you should be looking for about a third grade math book. Right, yeah, that's not gonna help. We gotta stay poised, alert, and focused on the moment and that situation and on the patron. We've got to view each interaction as new and unique, even if it's not. Say, say I'd been coming in every week for the last six months asking about the same thing. So it wouldn't be validating for me to say, the answer is the same as it was last week, Mr. Jones. Right, or what, what if my own needs are interfering and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling really pushed? What, what's a real... Can we please wrap this up? It's time for lunch. Right. Now, I think that I feel so strongly about validation as an effective way to diffuse crisis that I want to delve into it even further and I want to look at the six levels of validation that are often categorized. The first level of validation is simply to observe and listen. And by listen I mean really listen and that's not as simple as it might seem. We don't want to listen to what we think they're saying or what we wish the person is saying. We've got to really listen to them. Now, what are some other ways that we can convey that we're really paying attention? You could say something like, tell me more, what happened next? Uh-huh, and are there other things that are important? Your nonverbal communication is gonna be really important here. You're gonna wanna make eye contact, nod, to show that you are really listening. The second level of validation is known as accurate reflection. Try to come up with verbal responses that reflect what the patron's words really were. That way they know that you're really listening, because you're not adding anything and you're not taking anything away. And you might try to summarize what they're saying to you. So this time, I guess, Tanya, you're going to get to be our disgruntled patron. Okay. What is the holdup? I need to check this stuff out right now. So you want me to expedite your checkout even though you know that your card's on hold and that you have over, well, $500 in overdue library materials? Hey, prove it, buddy. I need to check this stuff out right now. Wasn't very validating, was I? Now, maybe Amanda can show us how you could validate what Tanya actually said by accurate reflection. I need to check this stuff out right now. What is the holdup? Tanya, I realize you're in a hurry and I want to complete your checkout. Well, it's about time somebody gave me some help around here. Of course, we know that there's always going to be a next step, but we began by validating.
The third level is trying to read thoughts and emotions. We might be really trying to listen, and we might want to summarize what the person is trying to say, but we may have a hard time understanding it, or what they're saying may seem at odds with how they appear and how they really seem to be acting. So we've got to try to figure out as best we can what they really mean. Now in doing so, we've got to be careful not to assume that we're right and we've guessed what they're thinking. But we can use phrases like, it seems that you are, or it might be really frustrating, or is it possible that you're upset because... The fourth level of validation is looking for understandable causes. These are things that are contributing to the level of escalation that our patron's showing. Um, they may be things that have happened like they've had a bad day, so you could ask, are you okay? You know, how's your day been? They might be feeling poorly. You can ask how they're feeling. Um, I know, and you guys know as well as I do, that a lot of our uh, clients who have mental illnesses here have told us that they've had some very unpleasant experiences in the library. And so, you know, they might have had, the patron might have had a bad experience in the library in the past. And so you might want to say, you know, is the library a place that makes you uncomfortable if you had bad times here before? So, uh, you know, we want to try to find things that help us make sense of the patron's attitudes and make, make, maybe help them make sense of their attitudes as well, which will reduce the escalation from that point on. Now, uh, let's see how we can make that work, and uh, who's going to be the patron this time? I'll do it. All right, Tanya, have at it. Okay. You never have the books that I want when I come into this library. Now, I pay taxes, and I want to know why you don't have the books that I need. Well, no one else seems to complain about our selection service. You must be into some weird stuff. Well, that sounded really condescending didn't sound like you're really listening and you weren't really responding to Tanya. So that's not very validating. Now let's see if we can work this fourth level of validation into a response. Okay. You never have the books that I want when I come in here. I pay taxes and all I ever get from you is a bunch of crap. Well ma'am, it sounds to me like perhaps you're having trouble finding things that really interest you. Let me ask you, have you had a lot of trouble finding things that you like here in the past? Well, yes, I have. In, in this case, I recognized not only that the person was expressing to me that they were upset, but also that they had had a pattern of being upset when they got here, and that helped diffuse things. The fifth level of validation is understanding and being able to communicate that the behaviors and actions are normal for them, that they are reasonable, meaningful and that they are doing the best that they can. So let's take a little look at how this works out and see if we can understand it better. And uh, Tanya and Amanda have a little uh, role play here for you that hopefully will let you see kind of how this works. Okay. The demons in these books are possessing me and I do not want them near me anymore. Anyone would feel like throwing those books if they felt like they were possessed by demons. Well, that's right. Okay. That was a very validating statement. The sixth level of validation is being truly genuine. It's safe till the last because it's usually your last resort in validation. And at this point, you're as much validating yourself as you are the patron. But it still can be helpful and it still can be validating because you're still being honest. You're telling the patron the truth about how you feel. You're down to that. You've tried to look at their feelings. You've tried to listen to what they say. And, uh, you know, now you've had to come to the realization that, you know, you've got to take care of yourself. And this can sometimes validate the other person, but you're validating yourself as well at this point. So you're not being patronizing or superior. What, what's something you could say as an example of that? Well, if I had a patron who was at the desk and really loud and disruptive, verbally accosting mm -hmm. me, I would say, I, can, I can't help you anymore. Right. There's nothing I There's can do for you. There's nothing I can do for you. What, what's another way you could put it that's you really specific? Say, I can't help you while you continue to verbally abuse me. Right. Yeah. It's fine to be specific like that. What about professional roles at this point? 
professional roles have pretty much gone, gone out the window at this point. You're talking human to human, but it's important to remain respectful. Too. Right. I think, you know, making a statement like, it is my job to do such and such. It's totally unhelpful if things have progressed to this point. The, pretty much sums up the six levels of validation, as much time as we can spend on them today. Uh, to reiterate, you're never going to think, I'm using level four, I'm using level three. You're just going to try to intuitively learn how to use validation as part of your everyday communication. And it works great. It works great in your family life. It works great in your work life. It works great dealing with people in uh, retail and other settings where you don't even know them. And you'll be amazed at how people start treating you if you start validating them. Let's take another look at our stress model of crisis. The triggering event moved us off the baseline. Then escalation was a slow ascent up a slope. Now sometimes, in spite of our best efforts, we're going to climb that hill and that wavy period of full-blown crisis with its imminent threats of violence, assault, and property destruction is going to descend upon us. Now, that's a really failing situation when that happens, but what are some of the things that should have long ago been done? At this point, we should have called the police a long time ago. Right. So they should be on their way and yes. hopefully almost there. And what's our main concern at that point? Our own safety and the safety of others in the area. Right. De-escalation has failed, so there's no use continuing to try. However, as we know, you should try to continue communication in crisis. And what's a way that we continue it? communication in crisis. Well, we have this handy little rule called the rule of five. Yes. Using that rule, all of our sentences would be five words or less, and all of the words we use in those sentences would be five letters or less. Amanda, what's a real common rule of five sentence we'd use in the library? Sir, you need to leave. Right. Now, they may not be listening, but we've at least shown that we still have some poise and control of ourselves, and we're attempting to communicate. After de-escalation or crisis has occurred, the next and inevitable phase of our model is recovery. So the fourth phase in the uh, stress model of crisis is recovery. Now, it's really great if we've achieved that without hitting crisis, you know, if the slope just goes up and gently down. How should we feel if that's happened? We should feel very proud of ourselves. We should congratulate one another right. and talk about what we, worked and what didn't. We've been successful. That's right. Right. And uh, I think we can always look back on past experiences and use them to help us communicate more assertively and effectively in the future. Now, let's say we weren't so lucky and we have the failure of crisis occurring. Then uh, what, what should we do with the person who's in crisis after authorities intervene? Our responsibility in that situation has been alleviated. The, the intervening authorities are now responsible for that person. Right. Who should we be thinking about at that At time? this point, we should be thinking about ourselves. Right. Um, we can do what we call debriefings and discuss what happened with other staff, the pros right. and cons, what was positive, what wasn't, and don't be afraid to seek help either. If you. Right, because if you'll notice, the very last phase is called the post-crisis depression, and that's real. And if you notice, we're not at our baseline there either. We've passed the baseline the other way, and we've dipped below it, and we don't want to get stuck in that place where we're below our baseline. Well, we've covered the whole model, and I hope that some of the uh, material that we've presented here today will be helpful to you. And I hope that uh, you can meet the challenges ahead with increased confidence and with some ideas of how to practice more effective communication and poise and response with crisis. And I hope the next time you wind up safe when bad things happen to good librarians. Thank you for your time and for your interest in our training. We hope that you feel a little bit more confident now that you have some tools to help you deal with crisis in a calm and poised manner. If you wish to share your experiences or seek more information on this topic, contact Tanya Hayes Martin directly through the Librarian 411 website at www.librarian411.org.